Welcome to Tax Law GH and welcome to our video on the taxation of gains and gifts. In this video, as you can see from the title, we have two things to talk about. How gains are taxed and how gifts are taxed. It's a very practical area that um, if we were to implement the law, it would be very interesting because when you give to your girlfriend or boyfriend the newest iPhone, there is some gift tax due, but I mean, who is going to implement that? So. Um, first thing, let's talk about taxation of gifts and then we talk about taxation of gains. What does the law say with regards to taxation of gifts? Now, for some bit of a background, some bit of a history lesson, um, we had an old income tax law, which is the Internal Revenue Act of 2000, Act 592, now repealed um, and replaced with or by the Income Tax Act of 2015, Act 896. The difference between the two was that under the old law or the repealed law, we had a separate regime, a separate mechanism for the collection of gift tax. It was a standalone tax. Under the Income Tax Act, we have tried to fuse all the different streams of tax income with the gift concept. So what it means is that if you receive a gift in the course of exercising your employment, then it will be taxed as part of your employment income. Generally, if you receive a gift as part of conducting a business, then we'll add that gift to your business income and tax them together. Same for an investment. If you receive a gift in the course of conducting an investment, then we add the gift value to the investment and tax together. So let's take the specifics now. When it comes to employment, what does the law say? We've covered this into details in our series on employment income. At the very basic level, we said Employment income is essentially the person's gains and profit from that employment. So everything you benefited from, from that employment will qualify as your income from an employment. And we are saying that anyone doing the computation of employment income must include a number of things. We had a very tall list. I've taken just one line out that is relevant for our discussion here, which is you must include other payments, including gifts received in respect of the employment so an, an example if you are a waiter or a waitress and someone comes to your restaurant and they give you a tip can we argue that that tip is a gift that you received in the course of exercising an employment and if yes should we tax that gift and you should disclose this to your madam your mistress whoever and let them know so they add it to your employment income for the period and tax it because it's a gift you receive because you exercise in that employment as a waiter or waitress. Don't forget that someone else who is not a waiter or waitress would not receive that tip because they are not exercising an employment in that particular restaurant. So it's a benefit you are getting that not everybody is getting. So there must be a way to allocate tax to that value. So take our point is for gifts you add gifts received from employment to employment income and then the question someone may ask is at what rate would you tax this then the answer is the same rate that you tax employment income so if the person is a resident individual then you'll be at the personal income tax rate which some people like to call the graduated income tax rate ranging from zero percent to a marginal or top 30 percent based on our current rate if the employee is a non-resident, then you apply a 25% flat rate on all the employment income, including the gift. So take note of this. The next is let's look at gifts that arise as part of a business. So what does the law say when it comes to determining income from a business? We are saying that once again, for income from a business, it's the gains and profits you make from the business. Then the person has attained the business income must include a number of things. It's a tall list. I've taken the most relevant part out here, and that is a gift received by the person in respect of the business. So if someone donates to you, someone gives a gift to their business, is it taxable? Well, you received it, it's coming as an inflow, and um, it's a gift for the business. Don't forget that. On the side of the donor, that's a different story altogether. They may be exempt if you're, you're the recipient, a charitable organization, registered under the Income Tax Act, Section 97, not relevant here. But remember that a gift received in respect of a business is part of business income 
and should be assessed and taxed as part of your um, income. Question then is, what rate would you tax such a gift? Then the answer is same rate that you ordinarily tax the company's other income. So if a general company, then 25% will apply. It's, if it's probably a mining company or an upstream oil and gas company, then you apply 35% to their total income, including the gift. Let's look at a special child, which is the one from an investment. Now, the general rule follows with just one exception. So as usual, we are saying that for income from invest investments, it's the same concept, your gains and profits from the investment or from conducting the investment for the year or for part of the year will be your investment income. Then in ascertaining investment income, the law gives a all less dividends, annuity payments and all that. Let's just pick the one that is relevant here, which is a gift received by a person other than a gift received in respect of business employment. For those who are interested in development of law um, to date, you realize I've cancelled one line here. That line was what we had in the initial Act 896 that was passed by Parliament in 2015, effective 1st January 2016. That particular provision was amended in, this, in 2016 by Act 924 and what this did was it changed the wording. So you can see the initial wording was a gift received by the person in respect of the investment. Then they changed that to a gift received by a person other than a gift received in respect of business or employment. What this effectively meant or means is that now any other gift that you receive that you did not receive from an employment or a business is automatically going to be a gift under an investment. If you read it carefully, that's what um, the meaning you can derive from it. A gift received by a person other than a gift from a business or employment. So if it's not a business gift, if it's not an employment gift, then it should be an investment gift. At what rate? Depends. Let's come to what the law says for individuals. So the law says where an individual receives a gift other than a gift received in respect of business or employment, that person, that individual may elect to pay tax at the rate of 15%. So if you're an individual and you receive a gift and that gift, you did not receive it from your employment, you did not receive it from your, um, your business, you just got a gift from someone, then you have the right to say you want to um, tax this at 15%. Don't forget that your options are really, you apply the personal income tax rate or you apply the 15%. So it depends on, you can do your your math and see which one will favor you, most likely the 15% will work for most people. So remember that individuals who receive gifts other than from a business or um, an employment have the right or they can elect to pay tax on that gift at 15%. So this is where um, the social debate on when your boyfriend buys a car for you, when he buys an iPhone for you, when you buy and uh, when you the girl buy a phone for your boyfriend what rate of tax what gift tax is due and um, that is up to when we begin to implement or when the GRI begins to implement some of these things then the rate is 15 percent on the value of the gift so you look for money and will pay the tax on the gift you receive so when you see celebrities on social media displaying range of you received there is tax due right it's a gift you've received it's not exempt and um, it's not exempt from tax so you're supposed to Assess the value of the, the car someone gifted to you, the Range Rover, and you can elect to pay tax on that at 15% because you did not receive that Range Rover from an employment or an investment. And I'm not um, being specific. Range Rover, I don't know who received what, but I'm sure you've been following um, developments on social media. So now that we know how gifts are taxed, let's come to how gains are taxed. And here to, by way of a quick um, recap, history development, we had um, a concept called capital gains tax under the repealed Internal Revenue Act. Um, here we've tried to, just like gifts, streamline everything together under the three main umbrella streams of income. So it's either employment income, business income, or investment income. Interesting thing is you cannot have a gain from unemployment. You cannot realize an asset as part of unemployment exercise so it's not in the scope so it means for gains unlike gifts where you can have a gift from an employment gift from a business and gift from an investment 
for gains you can mainly have gifts or gains from a business and gains from an investment what does the law say when it comes to taxation of gains from in a business income as usual we are required to include in the calculation of business income a number of things so in the previous um, a few minutes ago i spoke about the line that said you are required to include a gift received as part of conducting your business now on the side of gains you are required to include a gain from the realization of something called capital assets and capital liabilities of the business as calculated under part four which we'll look at very soon in the same um, video series so when you realize a capital asset or a capital liability then that gain you make is supposed to be added to your business income and taxed alongside your other income from business then an amount required by the fair schedule which deals with capital allowances to be included on the realization of depreciable assets of a person now this video will not focus on this second point because we have a comprehensive set series of videos that covers capital allowances for those who haven't watched or those who have watched and may have forgotten quick recap remember we said an account allowances when you realize a depreciable asset any gain you make will end up being added to your income for the period and be taxed if you make a loss on realization then will typically grant you something called an additional allowance or an additional capital allowance which will be an extra deduction from your income so take note we have dealt with this concept when we did realization of depreciable assets so our focus really here will be on gains on the realization of capital assets and capital liabilities so now that we've looked at the concept of business income and gains let's look at investment income and gains same concept you include a number of things in investment income when we did get a few minutes ago we said um any gift you receive other than from a business or an employment will be a gift from an investment what does the law say when it comes to gain from an investment it's saying a gain from the realization of an investment asset as calculated under part four which we'll look at like i said shortly so if you remember what i said for business income i mentioned capital assets and capital liabilities and the investment income the law is mentioning investment assets so it means we need to define capital assets and we need to define investment assets so that everything begins to make a lot more sense so before we get to the definition of capital assets and investment assets remember we had a provision under gifts for or gifts arising from investment income and we said individuals who received gifts that were gifts that were neither from employment nor business could elect to treat it or tax their gifts at a rate of 15 percent when it comes to gains or gains you make on realizing or selling let me use the word loosely realizing your assets then here we are saying where the chargeable income of an individual includes a gain from the realization of an investment asset not charged elsewhere the individual may elect that the gain from the realization of the investment asset less any loss from the realization of that asset will be taxed at 15 percent and then the remainder of their chargeable income will be taxed at the individual personal income tax rate as the case requires so we are saying that if you're an individual and let's say you own an investment asset which i'll define shortly and you realize it or to use the word loosely you sell it if you make a gain you are saying that that gain on selling your asset you have the right to say you tax only that gain at 15 percent similar to your treatment for gifts and then your other income can be taxed at a personal income tax rate take note from here that for individuals the law is specific for the 15 percent rate to apply must be an investment asset and not a capital asset every word in tax matters when it comes to definitions the definitions we must um, be aware of will be like i said that of capital assets and that of investment assets so how does the law define capital assets the law says a capital asset includes an asset to the extent to which is employed in a business or investment but it excludes trading stock or a depreciable asset 
So trading stock at the very basic level is inventory for those who are accountants. Those who are not accountants, trading stock is essentially at the very basic level what a business deals in. So if you are someone who sells tomatoes, then your trading stock is tomatoes. If you are someone who sells used clothes, then used clothes will be your trading stock. If you are someone who sells computers and laptops and printers, then those will be your trading stock. A depreciable asset is an asset that will be subject to capital allowances as provided for in the third shadow of the Income Tax Act. So we are saying that take away trading stock, take away depreciable assets. Those two are not capital assets. Every other asset to the extent that is employed in a business or an investment can fall under capital assets. So this is a very broad categorization of possible assets with the exception of trading stock, with the exception of um, depreciable assets, which will, the, will be the ones under class 1, class 2, class 3, class 4, class 5. Every other asset will be a capital asset. What is an investment asset? An investment asset includes a capital asset. So you can see that one falls within the other. So an investment asset includes a capital asset held as part of an investment being shares or securities in a company, a beneficial interest in a trust or an interest in land or buildings. But it excludes a number of things. It excludes the primary private residence of an individual where you live, your main um, home, right? Provided that the residence has been owned by that individual continu continuously for the three years before disposal and lived in on a daily basis for at least two out of those three years. So you are saying that an investment asset includes a capital asset that you hold as part of your investment, which includes shares, securities in a company, interest in a trust, interest in land or buildings, and it excludes a person's primary private residence, provided that they have owned that residence continuously for three years before they sold it. And then they've lived in that house for at least two out of those three years. This will not qualify as an investment asset. Take note of this carefully. So now that we've defined capital assets, we've defined investment assets, let's look at some specific provisions. How does the law recommend that we calculate gains and losses? Before we even look at what the law says, let's come back to first principles. How would you make a gain when you sell something? You agree with me that you make a gain when how much you sold the item for is greater than how much it costs you to buy the item. So if I buy a laptop for 5,000 CDs and I sell it for 7,000 CDs, you agree with me that I would have made a gain of what? 2,000 CDs. Very simple. Same way, how would I make a loss? If I bought the laptop for 5,000 CDs and I sell it for 4,000 CDs, I would have made a loss of what? 1,000 CDs. So, that is basic mathematics, that's basic um, first principle concept. Let's carry that over to the law and see how we can marry the two together. The law says a gain made by a person from the realization of an asset or liability is the amount by which A, the sum of the consideration received, I'll define that shortly, but for now, take consideration received to be what you received when you realize the asset or when you sold it, right? So the sum of the consideration received for the asset exceeds the cost of the asset at the time of realization. So same concept, how much you were able to realize it for or sell it for. I'm trying to not use the word sell because realization includes so many things apart from selling. So take note, but for now, before, before we get there, let's say that the sum you received from realizing or selling the asset exceeds how much the asset cost you, then you've made a gain. So you can see it's the same everyday meaning, right? So this is for an asset. For an asset, when how much you receive for it exceeds how much it cost you, then you've made a gain. How about a liability? And someone might wonder, how can I make a gain on a liability? You can. If the sum of the consideration offered for the liability is less than the amount outstanding at the time of realization, You've made a gain. Let me give you an example. You owe your friend 10,000 CDs. You are supposed to pay him 10,000 CDs. You come back and say, you know what? You are my friend, just pay me 5,000 CDs. Haven't you made a gain? You have. Because you would have paid 10,000, but he allowed you to pay 5,000. You saved 5,000 CDs effectively. 
So that is a gain you've made on realization. So here we are saying the sum of consideration offered, how much you paid for the liability, is less than the amount of and how much you're supposed to pay at the time of realization. So we say for liabilities, this is a principle. So take note for assets, your consideration must exceed the cost. For liabilities, your consideration must be less than the amount outstanding. That is for a gain. How about a loss? No rocket science here. It is the opposite. So to make a loss on an asset, then the cost of the asset must what exceed the sum of consideration received for the asset. So how much it costs you for is now more than how much you could realize or sell it for. Then you've made a loss. Same example I gave. For a liability, it's still the, re the reverse. Here, the sum of the consideration offered is more than the amount of standing. So example about your friend and how much you owe him. You owe him 10,000. Instead of paying him 10,000, you pay him 15,000. You've paid him 5,000 more. You've lost money. You've lost 5,000. So that is the simplistic and framework. So you can see here, the lawyer is not trying to be technical. It's your everyday meaning. Try and then use that to um, understand this concept. Now that we know how to calculate gains and losses, how does the law define cost? Because don't forget that we kept seeing the term cost of the asset, cost of the asset. Then we saw consideration received realization. So we'll define all of them separately. So it makes sense of how this whole realization concept works or how this, how this um, concept of capital gains works. So for the cost of an asset, we are saying the cost of an asset is the sum of a number of things. The first is the expenditure incurred by the person in acquiring the asset or in the acquisition of the asset. And it includes, where relevant, expenditure of construction, manufacture or production. That's the first item. So costs. If you're an accountant, you can just mirror this to your IA 16 on property plan equipment and your life will be easy. But those who are not accountants, nothing to worry about. Here we are saying how much you acquired the asset for is part of the cost. It's not the only component, but it's one of the components. And that acquisition cost includes even the cost or the expenditure of constructing it if you constructed the asset yourself. It includes the cost of manufacturing if it's something you manufactured yourself or production so anything you have to incur to acquire the asset or get it ready for its intended use is part of the cost of the asset for tax purposes in addition expenditure you incurred in altering improving maintaining or repairing the asset will also form part of the cost of the asset when we begin to look at exam questions under this please take note that the exam will just give you a number of items that you need to identify and sum together as cost it is this that the examiner will be testing, so please pay attention. Here, expenditure you incurred in altering, improving, maintaining, or repairing the assets will be part of the cost of the asset. Then, incidental expenditure incurred by the person in acquiring or realizing the asset. Incidental expenditure is essentially expenditure that you incur as part of the realization process. Did you have to get a lawyer to help you sell the asset? Did you have to get a valuer, a professional valuer, to value the asset? Did you have to pay? Did you have to pay an accountant to help you do your paperwork and all of that? All those are incidental expenditure that will ordinarily be part of the cost of the asset. And then one last thing, you also include something called income amount. What is an income amount? It's an amount which is required by the provision on accessible income to be directly included in calculating the person's income, or an amount that is an exempt amount or a final withholding payment. So um, this is not too common, but income amounts can also be included in the cost of an asset. Take note of this. Then the amount referred to above or what I just spoke about, which is derived from the sale of an asset or any other expenditure of the type mentioned and the cost of asset provisions as incurred by the purchase in respect of the asset will be part of the income amount um, estimate. We are saying that what we've said so far is what a cost of the cost of an asset will comprise of. The cost of an asset does not include a number of things. The first is something called consumption expenditure incurred by the owner of the asset. Don't include consumption expenditure. The next is excluded expenditure, an expenditure that is directly deducted from the income of the owner of the asset. We have defined excluded expenditure and uh, when we're doing um, company and business income taxes in that series of videos so that you can see the reference in section 130 of the Income Tax Act. 
the number of expenditure that are excluded um so bribes you pay taxes under the tax law depreciation all those are excluded expenditure you cannot add those to the cost of an asset that's what they are saying effectively then you cannot include expenditure that is already included in the cost of another asset so you can't double count if you've added that particular cost to another asset it's not fair you can add it to another asset um, cost builder what is incidental expenditure let's define that i gave an example but let's go through quickly it's any expenditure it includes the following advertising expenditure if you have to place an ad to get it sold it's a relevant cost because if you didn't place that ad you probably couldn't have sold it so you have to add advertising expenditure transfer taxes duties and other expenditure incurred as a result of the transfer that will form part of incidental expenditure also expenditure incurred in establishing preserving or defending your ownership of the asset will also be incidental expenditure if you had to go to court to protect the patent the copyright or whatever the asset had to do with before you could sell it's incidental you have to add it to the cost of the asset then the remuneration for the services of an accountant an agent auctioneer broker consultant legal advisor surveyor or valuer in relation to the expenditure is also incidental you have to add all of these to the cost of the asset so quick recap we are saying that when it comes to the cost of an asset what do you add quickly the cost of the acquisition including the cost of construction manufacture production then expenditure incurred in altering improving maintaining or repairing then incidental expenditure which i just explained and income amount so it is these items that will form part of the cost of an asset so we've looked at cost of an asset what is consideration received so he said if you remember you make a gain when your consideration received exceeds your, what your cost and you make a loss when the advice or the opposite applies but let's take this in for now let's pause here go over the things we've done look at the principles and concepts we've covered from gift tax all the way to um, estimation of gains all the way to what makes up cost all the way to where we are now then in the next series of uh, the next video we look at um, consideration received we look at what realization is then we go into the specific rules the law provides on what value to allocate when you probably sell something upon your debt or when you transfer to your ex-wife or your ex-husband what are the specific rules around all of those things we'll look at those in the next video so let's pause here um as usual if you like this video if you love it which you should um don't forget to smash the like button and to share this video within your entire network i'll catch you in the next video Thank you.